Good evening. Welcome to everyone. Thank you so much for coming. We're really privileged this evening to have with us um, Dr. Mike Edwards, who will be formally introduced later, speaking on the topic freedom, friction, and the future of knowledge for social change. Um, some of you may remember Mike, who received an award in this room two years ago, uh, the IKEA Award for, and the Gandhi uh, IKEA King Award for his contribution to, to peace building around the world. Thank you all for coming. This uh, plenary event is held in relationship uh, as part of a, a two-day workshop which we have going on here at the Cody Institute around the theme of research for change. What constitutes research excellence when you start involving communities and civil society organizations? This whole theme of, of how to link out to communities, how to do research with communities, of course, has been important to the Cody Institute's history. It's been part of St. FX and its commitment to service learning and community engagement over the years. Um, and it's very important to researchers and colleagues from around the country. So we're very pleased this evening to have with us, in addition to the St. FX community, um, about 25 researchers and civil society researchers from around Canada who are here for this workshop. Very happy that our Cody Institute Diploma participants have joined us. I think you'll find this relevant to your work. We welcome members of the St. FX community, uh, Dr. Riley, Dr. McLaren, uh, other faculty and, and students and staff. We certainly welcome a number of you here from, from the community of St. FX as well. In addition, uh, this is being uh, webcast live uh, and the word has gone out quite broadly to the IDRC community and to the Cody community. And so welcome to those of you who are coming on live. We will um, explain afterwards how you can also participate in the question and answer period. We're particularly pleased that this conference and this plenary is co-sponsored by the IDRC. Those of you will know IDRC is Canada's International Development Research Corporation. It's played a very important role in promoting development research around the world. And we're very pleased to have a number of the members of the IDRC team with us and that Cody and St. FX are partners with IDRC on this project and a number of other projects. So with that, I would like to welcome you again, but also welcome Dr. Ann Weston, who is the Director of Special Initiatives, including the Canadian Partnerships Program from the IDRC, who will say a bit more about uh, today's topic and uh, introduce our speaker. Anne, welcome. Thank you very much, John. Bonsoir à tous et à toutes, et merci d'être venu. It's a great pleasure to be here in Antigonish and at St. F of X University in collaborating with the Cody Institute to discuss what is excellence in research for civil society, for sustainable development. As John was suggesting, we've had a very lively and engaging discussion today so far, and we're looking forward both to this evening's presentation and discussion and then another day of reflection tomorrow. But before introducing our keynote speaker, Dr. Michael Edwards, I'd just like to say a few words about Canada's International Development Research Center, which is co-sponsoring this event and the workshop. Some of you may not know, but anyway, IDRC is a Crown, Canadian Crown Corporation which was created in 1970. We're based in Ottawa, where we have a staff of about 250, many of them people with a very strong research background and coming from countries all around the world. We also have four regional offices in Montevideo, Cairo, Nairobi, and New Delhi, from which we help to manage the research that we're funding around the world. IDRC accounts for a small but key part of Canada's aid program, with an annual budget of about $200 million, or about 3% of Canadian aid. We support research in developing countries to promote growth and sustainable development. We fund researchers as they find new ways to improve food security and health, overcome poverty and political exclusion, protect the environment, and adapt to climate change. IDRC believes that knowledge is key to development. 
A fundamental principle guiding our work is that societies build their own futures and must make their own decisions about development. So we help to build the capacity of people and institutions in developing countries to undertake the research that they identify as most urgent. So we, we believe supporting the work of these researchers in, is an investment in intellectual capital that's critical to development. We work with researchers and innovators as they confront the challenges of the 21st century within their own countries and contribute to global advances in their fields. We usually support research in four broad thematic areas, agriculture and environment, global health policy, science and innovation, and social and economic policy. And through our Canadian Partnerships Program, we support research collaborations with Canadian-based researchers at universities, think tanks, and NGOs. We also have a fellowships and awards program through which we offer support to doctoral students at universities in Canada, and also in a number of developing country regions to do field work on issues related to our core thematic program areas. So please, if you have any further questions about IDRC, please, uh, come and see myself or one of my colleagues afterwards during the reception. So let me now turn to our keynote speaker. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Edwards. Mike, as he prefers to be known, is an independent writer and activist currently based in upstate New York, who is affiliated with the think tank Demos, which is based in New York, as well as the global web magazine Open Democracy and the Brooks World Poverty Institute at Manchester University in England. From 1999 to 2008, he was director of the Ford Foundation's Governance and Civil Society Program in New York. And before that, he worked for the World Bank, Oxfam, Great Britain, Save the Children UK, and other NGOs in the US, the United Kingdom, Colombia, Zambia, Malawi, and India. He's written widely on the critical role of civil society globally and ph philanthropy, and has worked to break down the barriers between researchers and activists around the world, a subject that he'll be talking to us um, about this evening. As, as was already mentioned, he received an award in this very same room, so it's familiar territory for him. Um, and I think that was for his work uh, to unite spiritual practice with work for social justice. So please join me in welcoming Michael Edwards. He's going to talk to us for 30 to 35 minutes, after which there'll be an opportunity for questions and answers and further discussion before we then have a reception outside afterwards. So welcome. Well, thank you very much, uh, Anne and, and John. Um, thanks to IDRC for bringing us together for this week. A welcome, a warm welcome to everyone in the hall, to everyone who's watching on the webcast, and also, I understand, on local community TV. Thanks for coming or tuning in whichever media you're tuning in on. Uh, I'm here, I suspect like many of you, for a simple reason, because I believe passionately that the pursuit of knowledge is fundamental to the transformation of society in the image of democracy, love, and social justice. But exactly how that works, how knowledge and social change are connected to each other in concrete terms, is a hugely challenging question that I've been struggling with, and I mean struggling with my whole working life. I'm not here tonight talking as a sort of magician who can pull rabbits out of hats to answer the very complicated dilemmas that we are struggling with in our workshop and more widely in our work. But I do have some ideas and experience which I hope can be useful. And in the next um, 30, 35 minutes, I'm going to share them with you and talk a little bit about the challenges as I see them <clears throat> that lie ahead. Now, there are lots of pathways that we could use to explore these relationships between knowledge and change. And I've chosen one of them which I think is especially topical right now. And that is the struggle, as I put it in my title, between freedom and friction. So what does that mean? Well, very briefly, it seems to me that we currently enjoy an unprecedented amount of freedom to create knowledge and share it with others in new and exciting ways that are much more open, egalitarian, empowering, and democratic. But at the same time, Freedom is not an unalloyed good in relation to social change because it can overwhelm us with information and because it provides more opportunities for knowledge to be captured and manipulated by vested interests. And that's why we need friction 
as I'm going to explain it, applied in the form of both rigor and democracy. How we manage the inevitable tensions that exist between these two things, freedom and friction, will, I think, determine the extent to which knowledge is or is not a liberating force in the future, a central foundation for building democratic societies, or simply another asset whose control and ownership is superimposed on pre-existing patterns of inequality and power. So that's my central thesis. But before I go any further into elaborating, let me be clear what I mean when I use this phrase, knowledge for social change. How do we know what we know? It's an interesting question, isn't it? Maybe you found it in Wikipedia. That's mostly where I spend most of my days checking sources these days. Maybe someone you trust told you it was true. Maybe a recognized expert was in the room or a professor at the Cody Institute said, this is what, what's, uh, what's happening. Maybe because you can't argue with the numbers, there's a well-worn phrase, even though everyone knows that's exactly what you should do, right? When someone shows you some numbers, the first thing you do is argue with them. Or maybe you derive knowledge mostly from your own intuition, your own experience, maybe from all of those things. Do you actually look for knowledge or just search out opinions that confirm what you already believe? Actually, most of us do the latter. Outside the science laboratory, there is no objectively verifiable, universal, unambiguous truth. So knowledge for social change is always something that has to be negotiated and struggled over. And in that process of negotiation, hierarchies of knowledge are always being created and reinforced or broken down and recreated. Hierarchies that rank different forms of knowledge and knowing according to their supposed usefulness and legitimacy. But even then, if we're honest with each other, we don't agree on the rankings that they produce. So I'm going to use one that I find useful, it is fairly simple, but it's actually closer to what I would call an ecosystem of complementary approaches to knowledge rather than a hierarchy. And it consists of four things that nestle inside of each other like a stack of Russian dolls. You know those Russian dolls that we all have at home? They are data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. Data simply means numbers, which are important, but only form the basis for a conversation about what they mean. Information is data plus other inputs that constitutes the raw material, if you like, for knowledge production. Knowledge is information that has been analyzed and tested and processed in one form or another. And wisdom is the ability to use knowledge effectively in action. So that's, the, that's my, uh, my experience of different kinds of knowledge. And it's difficult to develop a wise approach to social change, I think, without having at least some data of some kind that describe what's happening. But on conversely, there are plenty of examples of data that aren't used very wisely. You could probably cite some of those in your own experience. So in that sense, wisdom is, if you like, the highest form of knowledge because it contains all the other three. But don't think of that in hierarchical terms. Think about knowledge as a sort of toolkit which has lots of different tools that have to be used according to the circumstances. When you think about it, a hammer and a screwdriver are not in competition with each other, right? Just as randomized control trials and storytelling can be equally valuable and legitimate. So what matters is how these different forms of knowledge, radically different, fit together to form a more comprehensive picture, but they are not in a competitive zero-sum relationship with each other. So that's so much for knowledge. What about knowledge for social change specifically? What does that mean? Well, I'm not going to be using that phrase to relate to knowledge that one particular group happens to agree with, whether that group is defined by politics or issues or identities or ideologies or locations or cultures. That, I think, will be far too parochial. Instead, I think it means knowledge that animates the general forces of public debate, collective action, and governments or decision-making, which combine to promote social change over many different kinds over long periods of time. That's the link that we have to get at. Alexis de Tocqueville, you probably studied him if you studied civil society in the 1840s, said this, in democratic countries, the knowledge of how to combine is the mother of all other forms of knowledge. The knowledge of how to combine is the mother of all other forms of knowledge. He was talking about the knowledge, both theoretical and practical, that is necessary for successful collective action, because that's what he was looking at when he traveled to America from France 
at that time. But I think the same observation applies to the different forms of knowledge that are required to equip people to participate effectively in democracy, community building, social accountability, public policy debates, or simply understanding who they are and what's going on around them as a precondition for successful social action, what's been described as civic or public knowledge in some quarters. Knowledge of this kind doesn't automatically shift power relations or produce social change, but without it, no social change is possible because the processes that under underlie it will be irredeemably weakened or eroded. So, knowledge for social change consists of ecosystems of data and information and knowledge and wisdom that are used to animate the public sphere and support the agency of people who want to change the world for the better. Now we've sorted that one out, pause for breath, phew. Let's move on to consider the struggle between freedom and friction that provides the context in which these processes are taking shape. I think for anyone who's involved in the world of knowledge, these are very exciting times. And that's principally because we have more freedom than ever before to invent, to create, to share, and communicate with one another. Obviously, the impact of the World Wide Web and social media of different kinds has been tremendously important in this respect. Uh, and although information technologies, we know, have some ambiguous social and political effects, that's true, it's indisputable, I think, that they lower the cost and increase the speed, ease, and reach of information exchange, enabling an unprecedented level of access to knowledge, assuming, of course, you have an internet connection. That's one big assumption. But it's also true that other forms of experimentation are growing. There are lots of new and different ways of producing and communicating knowledge that don't have to be restricted by conventional boundaries. Co-creation, creating knowledge together, is much more common nowadays, made easier by techniques like data visualization and storytelling, participatory theater, and many others, which don't require, if you like, the same credentials and training that conventional knowledge production does. It's also true that the production of knowledge is experiencing the same process of what's called disintermediation that's common to other forms of production in the modern economy. That simply means that large intermediary institutions, like the one we're sitting in, universities and think tanks and even perhaps NGOs, are being challenged and may eventually be replaced by new kinds of knowledge organizations and knowledge brokers like distributed networks that look and act very differently. And that's especially important at a time when higher education is moving in some quarters more towards what you call a corporate model that delivers highly specialized and profitable knowledge to other academics or on contract to governments and businesses on the one hand and much more basic knowledge or perhaps just information to students on, at the lowest cost possible on the other. They're not here, of course, at St. Francis Xavier University since Moses Cody would come back from his grave to haunt you if you move in that direction. But in many other parts of the world, it's true. The social change role of the university, and I would argue other formal knowledge institutions, is gradually being eroded. But so what? You could argue that that trend is, in any case, being counterbalanced by the explosion of knowledge communities outside of formal education, especially as those communities tend to be populated and animated by a different knowledge culture, particularly, I think, among younger people who are much less comfortable with traditional hierarchies of knowledge production or fixed standards of leg legitimacy and rigor. And that's actually great news for disadvantaged and marginalized communities or people who are outside the loop of those formal education institutions. Now, of course, there are some threats to this freedom and diversity and experimentation from some quarters. I'm not ignoring those. Government censorship and increasing surveillance, for example, and because the infrastructure of communications, including social media and the web, is still owned by large corporations. So eventually they will make that, um, uh, they will influence the process of knowledge production because they own the infrastructure through which we create it and communicate it. But even then, it's going to be very difficult to block the emerging processes of knowledge production and sharing that are emerging because they can simply move elsewhere. You close one down, another one opens up. So increasingly, the message is clear. If you want to create knowledge, then go ahead. You don't need to play by someone else's rules any longer. And believe me, I know what an exciting prospect that is. I actually launched a new web magazine in July to tell the stories of people who are transforming their societies. It was started for peanuts, it runs on a shoestring, it's totally open access, 
and has already reached over a quarter of a million people in 115 countries in three months. Check it out at opendemocracy.net backslash transformation. That's my first and only advert for the website. Um, but it's exciting stuff, and you can do it with very low overheads, although it's hard work, I have to say, for the editors. So, and here I'm looking at everyone individually, if you are not making the absolute most of the freedom that's now available to all of us to generate and communicate knowledge for social change, then get moving, because otherwise it will pass you by. Those exciting opportunities are exploding all over the place, but are we involved in them? But, and it's a very significant but, freedom is not an unalloyed pleasure, and it doesn't by itself solve the problems of knowledge for social change. And there are two reasons for that. The first is that it's increasingly difficult to make sense of information and channel it in the right directions when there's just so much of it about. It's that proverbial problem of drinking from a fire hose. You know, you just can't absorb the vast amount of information that's coming your way, let alone process it into knowledge or wisdom. So you have to ask, if that's already the case, why make that problem even worse by generating more of the stuff? Why do we keep on generating more and more information if we can't process the stuff that we already have? To be a bit more provocative, I think on pretty much every issue that's important in social change terms, it's not actually that we lack information or even knowledge about what we have to do, or what we could do, or what the options are. The problem is that the knowledge we already have is ignored or disputed. But maybe that's inevitable, because the more information you have, the lower the barriers to entry, the more accessible it is, and the more filters you're going to need to check facts, scrutinize statements, make advocacy claims more transparent, balance different views, ensure that there are no missing voices, or simply make more sense of all this stuff to process the raw material in along that chain from data to information to knowledge to wisdom. And because we have a volume problem, we also have problems of speed and superficiality because time is squeezed out, attention spans are shortened, and short-form argumentation is prioritized. Welcome to the world of the summary of the summary. The executive summaries on all those reports eventually will be just a paragraph, then a sentence, then the 140 characters, probably, on Twitter. Welcome to the world of the mandatory op-ed that's posing as a substitute for the essay. Uh, welcome to the world of front-loaded books that publishers increasingly demand because they know that people will only read the first chapter if they read anything at all. Read less, no more is the title of a new series of short books from The Guardian. Puts it in a nutshell. Read less, no more. If you thought that getting your message across on social media, like Twitter and 140 characters, was tough, then try the new generation of text apps like Kakao Talk and WeChat that are taking traffic away from Facebook. And if you don't know what the hell I'm talking about when I'm using these words, then find someone under the age of 25 at the reception afterwards, <laughs> apply them with a glass of wine, and ask them what the hell the guy was talking about at the podium. <laughs> Once I was a scuba diver in a sea of words, writes one critic. Now I zip along the surface of knowledge like a guy on a jet ski. Once I was a scuba diver in a sea of words, now I zip along the surface of knowledge like a guy on a jet ski. Who will have the time, the commitment, the courage to delve deeply into the world of knowledge and up for social change under such conditions and what might be lose as a result? Speed and convenience don't lend themselves to the interrogation of assumed truths and uncontested facts. Who needs an editor when everyone has a blog? or can submit material to sites like Huffington Post that accept or reject it virtually unchanged? Who needs peer review when publishers are more interested in controversy in your clout score? Indeed, who needs a university, an institution that may end up as outmoded in the next century as the Encyclo Britannica is today? The second problem with unprecedented freedom that we enjoy is that it creates more opportunities for knowledge to be used or misused or abused or manipulated for political, ideological or commercial ends and not for social change. Those who celebrate freedom always see an emerging knowledge commons, but a knowledge industry might be more realistic given the world that we live in. The playing field for knowledge production is never level, nor is it populated by people whose only goal is truth for its own sake. It's a battlefield we have to recognize 
between many different interests that use knowledge to advance their objectives and therefore think nothing of adapting it, twisting it and filtering it to support those goals. Painfully, of course, that also includes you and me, or at least includes me. You may claim that you're immune from these tendencies, but I'm certainly not. We all shy away from discordant information, especially when it contradicts our sacred cows about what social change is and how it's to be achieved. But the art of thinking is supposed to be painful. It's supposed to be difficult because that's the only way our assumptions will ever be exposed and tested. Now, some of this manipulation is straightforwardly commercial. Paying to promote one of your posts on Facebook, for example, whether it's $30 or $150, whatever it is, regardless of the content of the post, it's how much money you have to promote it that's what matters. Or what Wikipedia calls non-neutral editing, which basically means people being paid to promote particular things on Wikipedia under the guise of independence um, and neutrality. Or take the email I received last week from something called the Banner Alzheimer's Institute in New York, inviting me to a briefing and promising to pay me $100 if I wrote a short blog post afterwards. Thank you very much. I thought it was only when I read the small print that I found that the institute was linked to a drug company called Genetech, which is pursuing trials of a new drug at Columbia University to treat Alzheimer's, and that my blog will be expected to extol its many virtues. That's a small example of a much bigger problem that you'll know well if you work in a place in which only certain kinds of research attract commercial sponsorship, or if you work in a think tank like I do, that's funded by foundations or corporate donors who have their own particular knowledge agendas. Increasingly, we get the knowledge that someone, somewhere, is willing to pay for. But of course, knowledge can also be and is manipulated for political or ideological ends. Advocacy campaigns become obsessed with marketing a limited range of ideas instead of engaging with the public in a search for genuine understanding. Internet trolls and sock puppets, that's people with uh, users with assumed identities going online, post deliberately misleading commentary and articles. Astroturfing is spreading, which means creating the false impression that your ideas have mass support. And of course, many people who produce and disseminate knowledge are simply barefaced liars. It's always worth remembering that, I think, when you're active in the knowledge universe. These problems are not, of course, always due to deliberate misbehaviour. It may simply be that the same body of knowledge is read differently, interpreted differently by different groups. That's, what hap that's what's happening in the USA now. For example, around charter schools, those are private schools run on business lines in the public school system, where both pro- and anti-reform factions draw radically different conclusions from exactly the same base of evidence. Or take the example of golden rice, genetically modified and vitamin-enriched varieties that are seen as a saviour by some or a Trojan horse for Monsanto by others, researchers and activists who are measuring and evaluating them against totally different criteria. At its most developed, which could either be a good or a bad thing, the goal of overtly politicised knowledge production is to dominate the entire intellectual environment in which decisions are made, from academic journals to op-eds in major newspapers, since that's the best way to embed the dominance of your ideas in the body politic and the popular imagination. And when you do that, ultimately, opinion and ideology become fact or common sense, something that's already happening, I would argue, around the role of markets and privatisation in the provision of public services, for example, we now sort of have a common sense view, which is not common sense at all. It's been deliberately constructed over the last 30 years. As a result of these two developments, information overload and the ease of manipulation, knowledge is increasingly a sphere in which a certain amount of oversight and accountability are actually essential to the goals of social change. And that's why friction is so important. When you think about it, friction in any situation does certain things. Friction slows things down. Friction gets in the way of easy decision-making by promoting participation. It gives more people a voice in the knowledge production process. Like rocks in a stream, friction helps us to surface, discuss, and negotiate different views and interpretations, and to reach consensus over time as those sharp edges are rubbed away as we knock against each other in discussions and debates. The absence of friction might seem to you to be attractive when we want to create knowledge for social purposes. But actually, it can privilege powerful interests that lurk in the background. So even though it's paradoxical, perhaps, 
friction in the form of restraints and rules and standards and so on is needed to preserve freedom and independence in knowledge production and to avoid that process becoming dominated by vested interests. So how can friction be applied? Well, I think there are two ways. One is through the application of rigor and the other is through the practice of democracy. And those forces often pull in different directions because rigor implies at least some degree of closure and hierarchy or at least verticality while democracy demands openness and equality, or at least horizontal connections. But both of them are important. You could say that these tensions are actually embedded in the very nature of the work we are doing, especially if, like me, you're a social scientist. That's a phrase that, that trips sort of comfortably off the tongue, social science. But I have to stop myself and remember that it's actually made up from two separate and very different words, the social and the scientific, that are woven around competing or contrasting strands of DNA. It may sound anachronistic to you to defend ideas about academic rigor in a conversation about knowledge for social change, but that's what I'm going to do. Because rigor is crucial in unmasking ideology and self-interest in knowledge production. So what do I mean when I say rigor in that sense? To me, rigor it means the painstaking passing out of problems and solutions, the interrogation of costs and benefits as objectively as possible, the ability to identify the individual pieces of a puzzle and put them back together again in patterns that can inform decision making, the skills of presenting different theories of change so that evidence can be re-evaluated from very different perspectives, the depth of understanding that's built up by studying similar phenomena or regions over long periods of time, the potential for accountability that results from the deliberate distancing of oneself from a predetermined position, and the freedom and the independence and the sheer bloody-mindedness to stand apart from the crowd and shout, no, this emperor has no clothes. All those facets of rigor are essential for knowledge for social change, and they are one big reason why the involvement of academics and other trained researchers can be so important in research partnerships with communities and civil society organizations, the territory that we're discussing in the IDRC-sponsored workshop over these two days. Rigor, of course, is not the exclusive property of the university, but it may well be easier to practice and protect there, despite the trends towards corporatization I highlighted earlier. Now, of course, this kind of friction can also work against social change. I mentioned censorship earlier, but we should also recognize the trends in philanthropy and foreign aid and so on towards a more technocratic approach to knowledge production, even what one writer calls quantifilia, the privileging of numbers, the love of numbers, the fetish for numbers, as indicators of rigorous research. As donors and governments, as they are all over the world, move more and more towards payment by results and value for money and so on, how those concepts are measured and interpreted become crucial questions, crucial political questions, in the process of knowledge production. And that's the reason why we need another second kind of friction that is rooted in democracy and participation, so that the definition and application of rigor itself can be thoroughly contested. Any definition of what is valuable or good or meaningful in knowledge for social change has to be as democratically negotiated as possible for the simple reason that there are no universally accepted reference points or measurements. Such judgments always depend on context and position and culture, and they are based on the bi biased and partial perspectives and priorities of different individuals, however educated they think they are. Research Excellence, which is the title of the forum funded by IDRC that's going on at the Cody Institute this week, could of course mean something quite narrow if it was defined in terms of traditional standards of academic rigor, or it could mean something very broad if it was defined to include other criteria, including relevance to policy and action, participation and empowerment of those who are involved in the research process and capacity development in the communities or NGOs concerned. That's, I think, the way that the workshop is moving, not to anticipate tomorrow. So structuring the co-production of knowledge in more democratic or participatory terms is itself a useful form of friction. And as anyone who's been involved in partnerships between researchers and communities or civil society groups will attest, there is always a lot of friction in those relationships. They are very rarely easy or comfortable because of differences in cultures and timescales and priorities on language and education and technical expertise. But that's a good thing, I think, 
because friction of this kind generates innovation and added value for both sides. If you didn't have that friction, you wouldn't be doing anything very interesting, quite frankly. But my experience suggests that whenever you encounter such tensions, it's best to acknowledge them so that they can be addressed, not to ignore them or pretend they don't exist. In some situations, these differences may actually be unbridgeable, so you can go your separate ways. But more often than not, such differences are manageable if you have good human relationships, flexibility on all sides, and a supportive context so that the sponsors of research and others are not breathing down your neck. And when researchers and activists agree to accompany each other over a substantial number of years so that trust and mutual understanding can develop, collaborative skills can be strengthened, and areas of common ground and disagreement discovered and aired and resolved or not, as the case may be, most of these problems that we find in research partnerships actually tend to drift away over time. You may not be able to solve them in an absolute sense, but you do find ways to manage them in a way that's good enough, and that's really all that matters. But maintaining this kind of continuity is important because, as some of the case studies that we're studying in the workshop show, the links between research and action, or research and influence, are nearly always surprising, non-linear and unpredictable. It may not be that final official report that makes the difference that you've slaved over for so many months. It may just be an unplanned conversation that you happen to have in the corridor of a government department, for example, that really gets things noticed. So, you have to be constantly flexible, be prepared to give things time, go with the flow, and be willing to be uncomfortable in the grey zones, the ambiguous neither one thing nor another spaces in which knowledge for social change is co-created. In conclusion, we have to make the best of both freedom and friction, as I've described them, in order to make knowledge a more powerful force for social change. And I think that means three things. First, stretching our imaginations about the nature of knowledge production to take advantage of the freedom that we now have to invent new modalities and methods. Second, developing better ways of imposing friction around these efforts to safeguard knowledge for social change that are rooted in both rigor and democracy. And third, forging, forging new communities of practice and partnerships and knowledge networks that provide the infrastructure for these two other sets of activities to take place. The overall upshot is that those of us who are committed to this path face a never-ending balancing act between different demands and priorities. It's the equivalent of keeping lots of those spinning plates in the air simultaneously and hoping that none of them crash to the ground. And there's no perfect way of doing that. There's no textbook, there's no model project, there's no training course, there's no magic bullet. To inhere within yourself all of the worlds of knowledge and action, of freedom and friction, of rigor and democracy is immensely demanding at both the human and the methodological levels which is why the pursuit of knowledge for social change requires a continuous personal and political commitment to this journey. That's what lies ahead for those of us who seek to contribute to the transformation of society with our hands and our hearts and our heads conjoined. So I wish you the best of luck in that endeavor and thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much, Mike. I almost feel like saying, would you read that again? Because you gave, you gave us so much to think about uh, at, at quite a high level.